Mojo, as you know, uh, the third international conference on family-centered early intervention is taking place in Austria in June this year. And they're really hoping to share as part of the conference um, some experience from deaf people about um, their early years and their later life. So perhaps you could share with us some of the things that your parents did right for you as a deaf child. I came to New Zealand when I was 14. My parents didn't know that I was deaf until I was about two and a half. Then my local kindergarten teacher said to my mum, do you realise that your child is deaf and that is why she's not yet speaking? And at that point, um, my parents, my mum, was taken with me to a centre where they fitted me out with a hearing aid, body aids at the time, and explained to my mother how to make sure I was looking at her whenever she spoke to me so that I would learn how to lip read. And then what my mother did was actually spend a huge amount of time with me. She basically taught me language by playing with me. We had a Doris house and she would pick up the bed and she would say, here's the bed, let's put the baby in the bed and I would start repeating back to her the word. At the same time as it was this play, she also read to me a lot and I learnt to read at the same time as I learnt to speak. And she did that so that I would learn about the small um, connecting words in the language, the an, it, is, that, this, all of these words because we often miss these when you're just watching people speak. Thank you for that. And now, as you've grown older, what makes you feel empowered as a deaf person? Um, I guess I feel really empowered when I can participate on an equal basis with my colleagues, when I can do the same things and access the same activities that they do. So that really means things like people being aware of what the barriers are for deaf people and what they need in order to be able to participate. Um, being prepared to change how they run a meeting, for example, so that it's well run and I can follow what is being said. Um, having access to things, services like captioning is also very important, or sign language interpreters for meetings. All of these things enable my participation and that's very important to me. What did you want to be when you grew up? My earliest memory is that I wanted to be a doctor and help look after people, make them better, help mothers with delivering their babies. Um, but I was told, um, no, you can't be a doctor because you won't be able to listen to people's heartbeat. And my memory is of feeling quite discouraged and wondering what I, could I do. And I think my advice would be that, you know, don't be too quick to tell a deaf child that they can't do things because you never know. Um, and things change and what might not be possible now may well become possible in the future with more technology etc. There are deaf doctors now so I could have actually started training to be a doctor and become one. So I think there's a very important message in there for professionals working with families about the power of messages. Absolutely, very important. Uh, what I would really say is that you need to encourage your child and use their dreams and their ambition to help drive their learning in the now and motivate them to do well in what they're doing at the moment. So for example, if a deaf child says, I want to be a doctor, just talk about the things, the skills you have to have and say, well, you need good qualifications in biology, so how about you put some effort into learning your biology? That sort of thing, really use their goals and ambition to drive their learning. And that idea of using goals and ambitions to drive learning, um, did that help you when you were young? I think what really helped me was that uh, there were very committed teachers who were um, really interested in my learning progress and really gave me good quality feedback as to how well I was doing and the areas I needed to improve and really helped keep me interested in, in learning for learning's sake. And I've been very fortunate that way to have had the input of very high quality teachers. 
and there were some other things that professionals did um, when you were a child that really helped you to access the rhythm of speech and the power of listening. Yes. One of the, um, when I went to the Mary Hare School in England for a few years before I came to New Zealand, um, there was a very strong emphasis on how to learn to listen. And that meant um, learning to d listen to the rhythm of speech to work out what must have been said. And I often say that for me, listening and following a conversation is a bit like putting together a jigsaw puzzle that this is being said and that's being said, therefore this is what must have been said from the information that you have available. And so in terms of listening to the rhythm of speech, um, what they did was put headphones on us and gave us a multi-choice um, selection of phrases and then we would listen to one of these phrases and work out which one it must have been based on the rhythm of the sentence. One of the very valuable bits of training that I got um, at the Mary Hare was that we, they spent a lot of time teaching us how to listen and to use our hearing, whatever hearing we had, to work out what people must have said or were likely to have said. And they did this by um, getting us to clap out the rhythm of common phrases how are you today, and that sort of thing. And also to listen for inflections that indicated that a question was being asked, and that sort of thing. And that has been hugely valuable to me, and I use the skills I learnt then all the time in my life now. Um, that I'm using a combination of watching people's lips, what sound I can get, the rhythm of the patterns of speech, and so on, to work out what must have been said. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You're using all these different bits of information from different sources and come up with the most likely thing that we've said and run with that. Thank you. You also commented earlier about, in terms of advice for professionals, the, to use goals to drive the programme. Would you just like to talk about that? I think most children uh, have something that they want to be. Um, what they want to be will change over time, but I think it's really important to use, capture their enthusiasm at that time when they express something that they want to be and use it to encourage and motivate them to take on subjects and to do well in these subjects. And also to install a sense of, yes I can, rather than no you can't. I like that. Pushing them to do better. I, I think it's really important that, it, um, that we don't accept half-hearted attempts as, as being adequate. If, if you know that your child is right, and if, if they were hearing that they would be able to achieve at that standard, I would encourage them to keep aiming to achieve at that standard, even if they're deaf. And in fact, especially because they're deaf, because otherwise it's so easy to get into a sort of negative spiral of under-achievement and I think it's really important that we can't have that at that. Excellent. What makes you proud in your work as a deaf person? Well, I'm New Zealand's first deaf member of parliament and I am proud of that. And I think what I'm particularly proud of is that I've had to overcome a fear of public speaking in order to become a member of parliament. And so whenever I give a speech in the house or a public speech where people come back up to me afterwards and say, that was a fantastic speech, I really loved what you had to say, that makes me feel that all of the fight to learn how to speak clearly, to overcome my fear of public speaking was worth it because I have a message that's quite unique and the voice of deaf people needs to be heard in Parliament, just as it needs to be heard everywhere else. Thank you. Thank you. So what do you think about captioning on this movie? I think it should be captioned. Yeah, why? Because captioning helps a lot of people. People who might just find my speech a little bit odd, and the accent they might not be used to, all sorts of things, or even just older people with a little bit of hearing loss. 
all of them benefit from captaining as well. And besides, there may be deaf people who are teachers or parents, deaf parents of deaf children who may also be interested in this. 